based in London. We are, we are a small, not-for-profit, a social enterprise, uh, which was born out of the conviction, the passionate belief, that our public services are not fit for purpose. We were initially entirely focused on education, but we have become increasingly involved in public services across the piece, so including health, um, local government, um, juvenile justice, mental health services, um, a very wide range of public services. And we believe that social innovation is critical to all of these public services. They are too expensive, they are not meeting users' needs, and they are not fit for the 21st century as we face it, for a whole range of perspectives. Now, I'm so pleased that you've elected to think about this issue of student disengagement because I do believe it is a symptom of the underlying uh, unsuitability and failure of education systems around the world. This is not a phenomenon which is special to Catalonia or to Spain or to Europe or even to the rich northern hemisphere. Um, as I've said, we have the great good fortune in Innovation Unit to be working globally. Um, how it's arisen is strange. Perhaps these themes are becoming more globally intertwined. And um, I've had the good fortune to be working in places as disparate, as Ishmael has said, as Finland, which has been the top of PISA for so very long. I've been consultant to them for three years now. Uh, as well as South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal, the biggest state and territory. Both of these jurisdictions are equally, if you can believe it, equally concerned about the level of student disengagement that they are facing. Disengagement is not the same thing as absenting yourself and truanting or dropping out. And what we mean by engagement and disengagement is very central to this question. So one of the things I want to do today is to explore what we as educators really understand by this term engagement and disengagement and what it is that we are aiming for. What is it that we are really trying to do? And that's why I particularly like the second part of the title that I was given. Because it's not just about engaged students, as though if this is my student, it's his problem whether he's engaged or disengaged. Actually, it is a much more societal question. It involves not just schools and what they do, but how communities see and value education. So the second pass, part of the question I was given about creating active and engaged learning communities is equally important and very central. Um, as I've said, across the world, you will see many, many jurisdictions concerned about disengagement and unengaged students. By that distinction, I mean to say that some are disengaged in that they are gone. They are out of the door, either as soon as they can legally or even before it's legal. That is to say, they just disappear. But others are unengaged because they are gone in their heads. They are creating the reasonable results, perhaps, sometimes even doing quite well. But whether they are really engaged as learners is another question. And perhaps many of you sitting here will, in your own sons and daughters or young people that you know well, come across young people who seem to be achieving, but actually who aren't really in their heart and in their soul, turning into passionate learners. They're doing just what they need to do. So we are distinguishing here between the disengaged and the unengaged. And let's look at what the research worldwide tells us. This is so important because it's associated with a wide number of positive learning and life outcomes. Students who are not engaged with their learning are likely to low, learn at a slower pace and, of course, achieve worse. That's research from 2004. John Hattie, I'm sure many of you will know the research of John Hattie, which has become um, an extraordinarily well-known meta-study of effective teaching methods, points out that motivation and engagement in school have a higher effect on student achievement than numerous other in-school factors. In other words, it's a kind of golden key. You can get a lot else wrong, but if you get that bit right, then you're doing very well. 
And a little-known study from 2013 as an extraordinary one, John Abbott and Chapman, published in Australia, found that children's engagement with schooling predicts their occupation as adults, even when taking into account the effect of their academic performance at school. So holding academic performance the same, their level of engagement is a better predictor of their success as adults. Some of the research on this, which we find most interesting, comes from Canada, from the Canadian Education Association, a rich country, of course, um, with its various provinces, again, doing very well in PISA, but where they're extremely concerned about levels of disengagement. And if you look at the Canadian Education Association's research, um, those four bars uh, from the left to the right are to, well, first of all, you've got from elementary to middle and middle secondary right up to secondary schooling in purple. So that's the, the older you get going from left to right. And the bars are to indicate, first of all, participation. The second bar from the left is a level of uh, attendance. The third is a sense of belonging. And the fourth to the right is intellectual engagement. So the first thing to say, obviously, is that it, de it decreases with age. The longer students are in school, the more disengaged they get. Interestingly, in secondary school, the area where engagement seems to be steady is that area of feeling that they belong. So the highest bar there under secondary is a sense of belonging. Why? Because as they grow into teenage years, a sense of camaraderie with, with, with other teenagers, a sense of community with teenagers seems to grow. But look at what's happening to intellectual engagement, dropping down to something like 30%. 70% intellectually disengaged, irrespective of their results. And we know, of course, that disengagement is a far bigger problem for the most disadvantaged children. Numerous studies from across the world have shown that. So if you're poor, if you're from a one-parent family, if you're from an ethnic minority, your levels of engagement at schooling are much likely, are, are very likely to be much lower. However, I want to come back to this question about what we really mean by engagement. Um, if we were all speaking the same language, I would stop here, I think, and invite you to talk with your partner, and if we had time indeed, about what you actually understand by engagement. How do you know if a student in your class or your daughter is engaged in school or in learning? How, how can you tell? Is it because you've got eye contact? Is it because they're turning their homework in on time? Because they're not truanting? Would these count? We want to distinguish between engagement in learning and engagement in schooling. And we don't think that they are the same thing. So engagement in school, the researchers generally use five criteria or five characteristics. Does the student attend? Do they seem to be attentive? In other words, are their eyes open and are their eyes looking vaguely in your direction? Do they conform? Or are they coming to school in strange, ripped clothes and showing that they're placing themselves apart from the school community? Goths, whatever. Are they achieving exam results? Or are their exam results you know, terrible, indicating that their mind isn't with you? Or are they misbehaving? Is their behavior poor or bad? Now, that is the set of criteria which researchers have used to determine levels of engagement in school. But would you say that those are levels or criteria for engagement in learning? We don't think so. We think that if you are serious about engagement in learning, you mean different things. Are they energetic and enthusiastic? Is there passion there? Are they learning all the time, everywhere? Are they taking responsibility for their own learning? Rather than just doing what somebody else tells them, they are looking things up, trying to find new spaces to learn, taking their own responsibility, and achieving a wider set of learning outcomes. So not confining their learning just to school subjects, but thinking much more broadly. If your daughter comes home at the end of the day at school and you say, how was school, what did you do? And they say, I can't remember, it was all right. Or if they say, wow, we did this work on the heart 
and the blood supply in the heart and diet. And I've got to change it. And they are starting to think about it in a whole new way. And if they can talk to you about it with passion and interest, you know you've got an engaged learner, don't you? But those are not the things that researchers classically try to measure. And we think we need to shift the focus away from engagement in schooling, which has fundamentally been about compliance, towards engagement in learning. Focus on what's important. So remember that Canadian research which shows that basically engagement just gets worse as time goes on. Imagine a world where kids are as eager to learn throughout school as they were when they arrived. Eager, curious, energetic, passionate. How do we measure that? Well, I've already said that many, many surveys and much research, in our view, focuses on the wrong things focuses on conformity and compliance with schooling. But we have created a learner enga engagement survey for, you see this acronym GELP. GELP is the Global Education Leaders Programme. I won't say much about this other than to say 14 jurisdictions worldwide in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, China, Brazil, uh, South Korea, and there are two or three others I can't remember, have all participated in a programme to share thinking about radical innovation in education. And we, together with the University of Bristol and with the help of the OECD survey specialists, created a learner engagement survey for a programme I'm going to tell you about called Learning Frontiers. Now, this survey took a very different view. It said, from the research that we have looked at about real motivation and real engagement, there are five things we ought to be concerned about. Is learning a part of the student's identity? Do they understand themselves to be a learner fundamentally? Is it pervasive? Does it extend beyond the school? Do they learn wherever they are? At a movie, at the theatre, at a skating rink, on their skateboard? Not just within the schoolhouse, but way beyond that. Is learning social, involving relationships with peers and others? Do they talk about their learning with their friends? Is it deep? If learning isn't deep, then what is it for? Does it result in memorable and meaningful experiences? And is it relevant? Is it connected to their future lives, to the people they want to be, and not just connected to the next test. Because most learning in school is about the next test and not about the life you want to lead. So a survey has been constructed using constructs, those five constructs, to try to get at really serious areas of engagement. And we piloted this with four jurisdictions, how dissimilar they are, Finland, Kentucky, South Korea, and Australia. And our colleagues in those jurisdictions had um, samples of very varying sizes. But I want to give you one sample only, as we don't have a lot of time today, which is the Finnish sample. They took this very seriously. They surveyed 15,000 students in the age range 13 to 15. And here we are talking, let's remember, about what is supposed to be one of the best schooling systems in the world. And what they found was that young people appreciate learning, but they would frequently deeply bored at school. So, for example, in our survey, there's a question that goes along the lines of, um, you're asked, you know, to say um, often, very often, sometimes, never, you know, that sort of scale. And one of the items on the question is, um, how often do you pretend to pay attention, whereas, in fact, you're, you are thinking about something else entirely? And a huge number said, very often. They're just not there. They're doing what they need to do. So even in this top system, young people found school very boring. The pedagogies didn't suit them, but yet they were eager to learn. And there were significant minorities, even where you could tell a good, a good news story that, you know, 70% seemed engaged. 30% were displaying signs of lack of engagement across most of the underlying constructs. That is a very big minority. And this is in a reasonably successful system. The other outcomes were worse, but I don't have time to discuss them with you. We think it's a very interesting beginning. And these jurisdictions are committed to improving the survey and using it 
not to just rate themselves against other countries, but to have good conversations with principals of schools, with teachers in schools, and with learners themselves about what's going on. So the question it raises really is, what is an education worth having today, wherever you are? Because if a young person believes that an education is worth having, they will engage with it. I said at the beginning that in some of the surprising places around the world, we are finding disengagement and unengagement. South Africa, KwaZulu-Natal, where youth unemployment is just horrific, 80, 70 percent. You would think that in that context, young people would see education as their route to a good life and would seize every opportunity they could to get some kind of education. In fact, the reverse is true. Young people are dropping out very early in the system at 15 just to be unemployed and hang out on township street, street corners. Why? Because they don't think that what is being offered in school is an education worth having, even in those desperate circumstances. And in wealthier countries, we know that the same is true. Young people get that there's supposed to be a connection between education, schooling, and the rest of their lives, but they don't buy it. They don't see that that is necessarily the case. So the question is being asked wherever you are. And it's particularly being asked in countries which, of course, have been so deeply hit by the global financial crisis, here in Europe particularly, but all across the world, even in North America, which did not get such a bad economic shock. Still, uh, although youth unemployment is not that bad, the whole issue of what this cartoonist has called the graduate without a future is becoming an, an issue of serious debate. People are asking, is it really worth it? All those years through schooling, into college, three, four years, out of which you get what? A huge debt? and no guarantee of jobs. You may say, and you may argue, yes, but if you don't do that, your chances of getting a job are still worse than if you actually drop out altogether. So it may not be a guarantee, but it still seems like a better route. In the United States increasingly, I hope you can see that cartoon, it's from the New Yorker, to workers in a yummy cream donut stall and burger joint, I'm working part-time, but I'm hoping that once I finish my master's degree, I'll up my, they'll up my hours to full-time. So how many of you know PhDs or people with master's degrees paying off their debt in low-level jobs and wondering what they were up to? Take Google, who themselves are starting to question whether a college degree is the right way for them to select their employees. These are quotes from the head of human resources of Google who gave an interview to the New York Times in February this year. And he pointed out that they only take about 14%, or sorry, they take 14% of their hires now without a college education, and that is growing. They think test scores are worthless and predict nothing. They're not interested in the class of your degree or your general points average. It doesn't matter to them. They increasingly rely on their own validated, predictive, structural behavioural interviews. And they think that too many colleges just don't deliver on what they promise. He said, you generate a tonne of debt, you don't learn the most useful things for your life, it's just an extended adolescence. So what I have to say today is not just directed at schooling, as though schooling was just some, some kind of conveyor belt to get kids into college where everything is fine, we have to be asking ourselves about what higher education is offering students as well. Its relevance, its meaning, and the extent to which the offering, the, the degrees in college, are an education worth having. What are they for? Not least because career paths are changing and young people know it. In the 20th century, you maybe had one or two jobs and you would expect to have mastery in one field. That was your specialism. In the 21st century, we know there'll be upwards of 15. That's probably a conservative estimate now. You will expect to have breadth and depth 
in many fields. And some of those fields don't yet exist. They'll be constructed and invented in the next year or so. The implications of this, both for schooling and for higher education, are immense. For me, the implications are clear. Unless everybody becomes a passionate, lifelong learner, they will be lost in this world. Because all that will matter is your capacity to learn and to learn fast, your confidence in your learning, your resilience in your learning. Not least in a world where we've had an explosion of information technology. And as Ishmael pointed out in his introduction, innovation in education is not just about the technology, but my God, it has changed the context. And young people know these days that with the avenues and the routes to knowledge and to skills increasingly open and online, <clears throat> they look to schools for different things. I'm not saying that schools are going to become irrelevant, <clears throat> but they no longer have a monopoly on access to learning. Many of you perhaps will have joined uh, a massive online open course, a MOOC. I have, just to see what that's like. And as they are so open, and as they amplify and become more accessible to people of all ages, we're going to start to see different kinds of patterns emerging. That group there of businesses, approaches, pedagogies, hardly existed five years ago. And this world, when I say it's exploding, there isn't a better metaphor, really, because day by day we are seeing tens and twenty more apps all focused on education, which are profoundly accessible, many of them very, very interesting and exciting, and this world is changing enormously fast. Does this mean school does not have a role? I don't think so at all. I may not sound like it, but I am a passionate believer in schools because I think that they have many other functions to play, but they must change. In my view, they must change radically. And if you don't believe it, take a look <clears throat> at what was my book of the year for 2013, Al Gore's book on the future, and a really extraordinary look across what is going to happen to our world in the next two decades. And his conclusion is a simple one. Amongst scientists, amongst predictors and social commentators, there is a clear consensus. The future now emerging will be extremely different from anything we have ever known in the past. It is a difference not of degree, but of kind. And he fills that out with some features which I find well, it sort of blows my mind, really. Firstly, the emergence of rapid, unsustainable growth in populations and cities and in resource consumption. And secondly, the emergence of a whole set of new technologies. When we say technology, we almost always mean digital technologies. But in this new century of ours, already, biological, biochemical, genetic and material science technologies, which are coming together and according to the scientists quoted in Al Gore's book, are enabling us to reconstitute the molecular design of all solid matter and seize active control over evolution. If you accept that, this is the most extraordinary challenge to humankind. And therefore, an education worth having needs to be one which equips young people to deal with the seriousness of these challenges. And we're not even close. We are not even close. Young people themselves, it seems to me, really are much more value-driven and concerned about some of the critical issues facing our planet than we are. After all, they are going to inherit it. And it strikes me that some of the issues that really engage and make young people passionate Schools hardly reflect upon at all the major threats to our planet and how we are going to deal with those. Now, this is not a problem in waiting. This is a problem which communities, and I'm coming back to that business about learning communities, are dealing with now. And when young people engage with that in a real and authentic sense, 
Then we find that they make connections with their learning in fascinating, new and powerful ways. So how should education leaders respond to all of this? We are, after all, mostly in this room education leaders. If we accept that background which I've just pointed out, how should education leaders respond? Well, it really will depend upon your beliefs about change and about human motivation. Let me explain what I mean. I uh, was in the United States for a while recently and, and two things took my attention. The first was a copy of a, a well-known journal called Education Week, which was an issue on motivation and was looking at some attempts by schools to crack this very difficult problem of unengaged students. So it was running um, a, a cash reward system so that students who did well in their grades were able to claim cash rewards at the end of their semesters. I thought, oh, well, that's one way to go. Then, in a subsequent conference, I met um, a teacher of the year. I think he was California teacher of the year, because they had them for the states as well as nationwide. I suspect it was California teacher of the year. And he was a charming young man, really, really interesting, and obviously passionate about education. He was a maths teacher. And he'd been very concerned about how disengaged his students were in maths. They just, you know, listened to their headphones, talk, did anything other than listen to what he had to say. And he was at his wit's end. And he started to evolve his own methods to engage his students. And he did this by becoming a rap artist. And he showed us a number of videos which he had created of himself rapping the teaching of decimals. Um, you think I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. This is perfectly serious. And they were very funny, very engaging. He showed us two, one about how you place the decimal point. And as a result of this, his students were, you know, they, they watched. <laughs> they certainly noticed. And this had been much celebrated in his school. He was getting much better results. And as a result became, I think it was California Teacher of the Year. Forgive me, it might have been a different state. Um, but I was most intrigued by this approach. One, the approach which says incentives, cash. The other approach which said, we're not entertaining enough. As teachers, we're too dull and boring. So if we perform better, they will learn better. I think that both of these are misguided, quite misguided. And I think that the people pursuing them were very well intentioned and cared a great deal. But I don't think that that understands the nature of engagement or of motivation. Let's look at some of the research again. So if you want a pretty good roundup of the research on motivation, look at Daniel Pink, whose 2009 book, Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, takes a very broad view of psychological research, social science research, and also research done by economists. And he says there are three big things which motivate us as human beings. It ain't cash, and it's not being entertained. It's about autonomy, your sense of choice and control over what you do. The second is mastery, a growing sense that you have mastered a set of skills or a subject, and the excitement that you get through your growing sense of mastery. And the third is purpose, that you can connect this learning with purpose either to problems that you are facing in your own life, in your own community, or as you see them affecting the society that you are going to live in. I am totally taken by the arguments within the book and experiment after experiment, uh, very interesting clutches of evidence show that those three things are what are critical. Now, if we buy that, autonomy, mastery and purpose, there are some very clear implications for how we organise schools and how we organise learning. And I think most teachers know this in their hearts, but the difficulty is translating that into pedagogical practice. However, there are now many jurisdictions around the world really moving fast in this direction. And what I want to do in the time I have left is talk to you about some of that activity. So in short, we at Innovation Unit believe that these considerations of our current failures 
and the future challenges that face us point to a transformation and not just improving schools as we have them. So I am not sitting here talking to you about school improvement. I'm interested in transforming schools. And the word transform, since we're working multilingually here, comes, of course, from the Latin trans and form, change shape, look and feel and exist very differently, not just polish up the existing model. I want to offer you one way of thinking about engagement, which gives us some clues about how people may go. I don't know how well that... Could people at the back, are you able to read that? Yes, thank you, good. So one way to think about engagement is to break it down into three parts. The part that most people think about when schools say, yes, we've got, we, we, you know, we make, make very uh, big efforts to engage our students, is voice. Most schools these days have some kind of student council or parliament where students can go along and be consulted about things. Frankly, quite often that's rather trivial and low level, but sometimes it is important. And by voice, we mean those processes which increase student influence in running the school. And that's important because it is bringing them into living as part of a community and having a say in that community. So we now work with schools where, for example, um, students give regular feedback about the classes and the teachers who teach them. They will be involved in the appointment of new teachers. These teachers are going to teach them, so the students are involved on committees as part of selection procedures. They're also involved in the selection of head teachers or principals. So you can take voice to much deeper levels, but it's only one aspect of engagement. There's also the issue of leadership, learning leadership. And by that we mean processes which give students opportunities to lead the very direction of change. Not just how the school is run, but the kind of change that they want to see. I'll come back to that one and give you an example in just a minute. The most important, perhaps, is this top one, learner agency. And by that we mean learning and teaching processes which build that sense of self-efficacy and autonomy which Daniel Pink was talking about. And this is at the very heart of the learning process, the very heart of it, where students can start to feel an identity as a powerful learner who is growing mastery in subjects, who can make important choices, and is doing it with a purpose a purpose around their own life and the health of their own community. I want to give you some examples of these three ways of thinking about agency, uh, uh, learner engagement now. The first, um, I, very, I thought about showing you a video of this example, but I know I'm a bit short of time. All I will say, though, is if you Google the Harris Federation, the Student Commission on Learning, you will find a huge amount on this example, and I think that you will find it inspiring. This is a set of schools in South London, a very poor area of South London, um, high numbers of black students who are living in poverty and achieve very low, or were achieving at very low levels. And what the school did was to create a student commission on learning. This was about the learners themselves starting to become a powerful force for innovation. Across 10 schools, they set up a commission of around 70 students. They supported them with resources for research and staff members who would help them with their undertaking. But the student commission was asked a single question, which is this. What will make learning powerful in our schools? What will make learning powerful in our schools? And the students set about researching worldwide examples of really powerful learning. They set up Skype interviews. They invited to people to come into their schools. They emailed researchers across the world. They gathered a huge amount of evidence. And what was impressive was that it was global. And these students put together the evidence that they were getting about what was really powerful learning that could go on in schools and came up with a series of recommendations. By the way, I should say that the principal of the schools, it's a chain of, of them, said, Whatever the Student Commission on Learning comes up with, we will implement. 
In other words, he made it meaningful. So the students knew that it mattered. If you look at the website on Google, you will see videos of the students and indeed the staff talking about what they have achieved and how those schools have changed. Those learners have led the way for change. So that's one example. Let me tell you a little bit about the iZone in New York City. I know some of you in the audience are familiar with the state of play in New York, a huge system where examples of improvement have been terrific, but in the view of many people, much, much too slow, much too slow. So Mayor Bloomberg, when he was off in office, set up something called the Innovation Zone, which was a group of 300 schools setting out not to improve schools, but to transform them. And they were a group of schools who were committed to radical innovation in their context, particularly around this issue of engagement. Here's how they describe themselves. The iZone is a community of 300 schools dedicated to personalising learning. We're rethinking structures, creating new models, and promoting innovation across the system. And one diagram captures the shift that they're trying to make. Again, I suspect this might be a bit too small for you to read, but on the left, you can see the kinds of things that schools are currently characterised by. Their spaces, their classroom design, their curriculum, assessment, staff and student roles, programmes and schedules. And the students have to fit in with that. Those things are fixed. The students are on the outside trying to fit in with what the school is designed. And some of them, of course, spin off. They aren't going to fit in with that. What the iZone is trying to do is start with the students and reshape those things, the spaces, the classroom design, the roles, the curriculum, the assessment and the schedules, to fit with students. And what we are seeing in this iZone is an absolute explosion of new models for schooling, which is fundamentally directed at creating powerful, engaged learners. But the third one I talk about, uh, that I'd like to talk about and finish with, is the one that I'm intimately involved in, and which I would love you all to the, yourselves connect with, because Learning Frontiers is a new program operating across Australia of schools who are deeply worried about engagement. You see that their whole purpose is professional practices to increase student engagement in learning, and they want this to be a global enterprise. They want to connect with educators elsewhere. So when you Google it, you will find a website that you can follow and connect with. And I hope not just passively, but over time perhaps, make real connections as educators. So what's Learning Frontiers doing? Their aim is to increase the proportion of Australian students who are deeply engaged in learning through the development of teaching and learning practices that promote it. In other words, let's close that gap between what we know about motivation, what excites passion, and what it really looks like, and what we actually do in school. Let's close that gap. And they're going to measure it by the goal that Australia has set for itself nationally, successful learners, confident, active citizens. Pretty good goal, really. Not many nations have summed up what they are trying to do with their education system, and certainly the UK has not. I don't know whether you have done in Catalonia. But, you know, it's not a bad starting point. We often just take it for granted what the education system is for, what an education worth having is. But maybe we should actually be explicit the way the Australians have, and they've said successful learners, confident and active citizens. So what we're going to do is find the practices that create that. And they're going to do it by designing and developing and testing learning, teaching and assessment practices that foster engagement in an education worth having. They've put that in there and made explicit. They're not doing this, though, in a vacuum. They are going to use all the research we have about learning and what makes it powerful as a starting point. Innovators don't just dive in and, and, and think up something from their, their imagination without having as a springboard, as a starting point, the best knowledge base that we can get. And 
In order to go forward, the innovating schools in Learning Frontiers have looked to around four sources of research about what kinds of designs for schools are really powerful. The first book is this one, which is published by the OECD, called The Nature of Learning, Using Research to Inspire Practice. By the way, I think that's a great title. The purpose of research is to inspire practice. It's not for researchers to get another article published in a journal somewhere. Not that I'm having a go at researchers. I mean, I think that's fine. But that it should be about inspiring practice, I think, is fantastic. So that book brought together the state of knowledge, really, on learning sciences. So that was source number one. Source, source number two for design principles was taken from the Global Education Leaders Programme book, which uh, Ishmael mentioned, called Redesigning Education, Shaping Learning Systems Around the Globe. And in that, a series of principles for how education practice should evolve to engage students is set out. The third source was a book which we wrote two years ago called Learning a Living. Learning a Living is about radical innovation in education for work. That is to say, we looked at a range of innovators across the world who were creating quite two different models for learning, which were successful in getting young people into work, whether it was in poor villages in Bangladesh, which is what you're looking at here, or in further education in Finland, or in technical colleges in Brazil. We looked worldwide, and there were some really important lessons to be drawn from the work of these educators. So we have used those as well. And then great, great schools. There are some schools across the world who are just doing this work with extraordinary success. I want to give you the example of High Tech High, which is in San Diego, California. Can I just check how many people in the room have heard of High Tech High? Anybody at all? Yes, some at the back. OK. If you don't know it, Google it. They are the most extraordinary learning community who are running webinars, MOOCs, creating a global community of educators who are absorbed with the issue of, of student engagement. And High Tech High have four principles that they say are at the heart of their success. By the way, just to give you an idea, this school in San Diego takes a completely unselected student body, so you don't get in through test scores. People get in through a lottery because it is so successful. And 100% of their students go on to college, irrespective of their socioeconomic status. They have four principles. They say, the first thing is the primacy of the quality of student work. Everything come ba comes back to the quality of student work. They set incredibly high expectations. And if you get the chance ever to visit the school or just have a look at their website, you are astounded by the quality of the work that students can do. You know, it comes back to that issue about mastery. Most of the time, we don't ask students enough. We are unchallenging and unambitious for them. And when, in an inter educational context, people are really challenging, my God, the students take off. So the primacy of the quality of student work, integration of heart head and hand, practical things, cognitive intellectual things, and things that strike at your values and your emotions. They integrate the lot. Integration of students and disciplines. They don't track students or put them in different classes according to ability or achievement. They're all completely mixed up and comprehensive. And they teach in an interdisciplinary way. The General pedagogy is through project-based learning. Not all the time, but a very high percentage. And a great deal of it is cross-disciplinary. If you look at some of the videos on their website, you will see examples of maths teachers working with physical education teachers. You'll see arts teachers working with scientists and biologists and creating absorbing, absorbing programs of work. High levels of integration. And they see teachers as designers Teachers as designers. The job of the teacher is to design a learning environment, not how the chairs are set out, but a learning program which is powerful. And if you think about teachers as designers, you completely 
alter how you see our work. So the Australians took these as their starting point. The research from OECD, the Global Education Leaders Programme, Learning a Living, and examples of great schools like High Tech High. So here are some of their environments. Um, and I'm going to speed up because I know that we're going to have a discussion about this. But let me just say, out of all of this, the Learning Frontiers schools have themselves adopted four principles. And this, in a sense, is the very heart of what I want to say. If I said nothing else today, this is the heart of it. The schools have decided that there are four which will, will really engage students. And their work now is creating the practices around how to do that. The first is that learning is co-created, meaning that it recognises both adults and students as a powerful resource for the design of learning. It's not just down to teachers, it's students as well. They need to be involved in how learning programmes are designed. So co-creation is pr principle one. The second is connected. Now, partly that's connection through the fantastic world of information technology, but also the real-world context, context. So the work is connected and uses real-world context, contemporary issues, whether it's the threats for Aboriginal life in Australia, the degradation of the environment there, the lack of water affecting the country, racism within the country is a huge issue, or that simple issue of uh, reasonable good work for all Australians. So those contemporary issues are fundamentally at the heart of their learning design and is permeable to the rich resources available in the community and the wider world. In other words, they will use experts, whether they're at an open university or at a research institute, come, to come into schools and work with teachers and to use their environments for the students as well. The third principle is that it's personal. This comes back to the New York idea. It builds from the students' passions and capabilities. And it is possible to create curricula which reflect students' passions and capabilities to personalise their learning. And their final principle is that it will be integrated. They will integrate as far as possible subjects, students and learning contexts. By learning context, that means whether they're learning in a classroom in a museum, in a theatre, or at an internship in a company or a business, of which there will be many. So those are their design principles. And what they're now doing is to provide the opportunities and support for schools to develop their work and unite around these powerful design principles for engaged learning. What they're doing is setting up design hubs, using those design principles to develop new professional practices. And the hubs look something like this. You will have in the design hub a lab site, see that circle in the middle, which is a school or a couple of schools who want to lead the innovation in their area. And what they say is they are committing to the four design principles. So they're running a whole series of prototypes and experiments about new professional practices for teachers in those areas of four principles. But within the design hub too, there will be other partners. There will be developer sites, that is to say, other schools, classically in a design hub, there are around 12 or 15 schools. And those other schools won't necessarily feel that they are ambitious enough at this stage to use all four principles, but they will take one and really pursue it. It might involve a community group or a, a community resource, such as a theater, or a library, or an art gallery. So it's a community issue, a community learning process, and not just one for schools. That is the medium by which these Australian schools are trying to drive this forward. So far, there are five design hubs, something like 60 schools involved, but there are going to be a lot more. And what they're doing is this. They're taking a single principle, like being co-created, and breaking that down I'm not going to read these out because you can see it, into much more refined issues that's, that teachers can recognise. For example, if learning is co-created, students will be more independent and engaged learners when they help co-design learning activities. And then each school is thinking about their question that they will explore in a period of six or eight weeks. 
So one question from one of the schools is, how can I co-construct assessment that both promotes engagement in learning, what still meets the system assessment requirements? Because we've always got this tension, haven't we, between what the system wants to assess and what students think is important. And we have a series of schools pursuing some options on that. There's terrific energy in the system. I do invite you to look at the website and see if you can connect with some of those schools. I'm conscious of running out of time. I just want to leave you with this thought from Yong Zhao, who I know has been one of your guests. But I think Yong summed it up when he remarked, when the last PISA came out, that the East Asian education systems may have a lot to offer if you want to have compliant and homogenous test takers. If you want that, fine, look to Shanghai, look to Hong Kong, copy those systems. For those who are looking for true high quality education, Finland would be a better place now. It is a much more holistic, much more rounded, much higher quality education, but for an education that truly cultivates the creative, entrepreneurial, globally competent citizens needed in this next century, you will have to invent it. You will have to invent it. Not alone, but part of other communities in Australia, in New York, in South London. And now we can because we are part of a global education community. Global benchmarking can give you the best of the past, but for the best of the future, you have to do the invention yourself. I think is absolutely to the heart of the matter. And um, I listened recently to Howard Gardner. Do you all know Howard Gardner's work? And I have revered Howard Gardner my entire professional life. Uh, but he stood up and was talking about his research recently and how profoundly dep depressed he was about um, the objectives and the values of students and young people. And I started to realise that the, the, he was... His, his research is done on tiny samples of his own students in Harvard Graduate School. And if you think about the elites who are moving on to jobs in the financial industry, I felt like saying, Howard, you need to get out more. You need to see other kids. Because my experience, like yours, is that increasingly young people are questioning what it is that society has to offer and what they need to make instead. So they are, I mean, it's so hard to generalise about a whole generation, isn't it? I mean, an it's an absurd thing to do. But increasingly, I think, one sees people in a generation which does not take for granted that the only thing worth having is a high salary, a huge mortgage, two cars, etc., etc., but who are thinking about the quality of their life, about the relationship with their children, about the quality of their relationships, and about their stewardship of the planet. And I don't think that's too idealistic. I meet these kids, I know them, and I'm seeing them work in schools. And I'm seeing that where schools encourage that and put that at the centre of what they want to do, then there's no problem with engagement. So I think your question is spot on. It's about values. We always come back to values. I do think that there is a very, very big problem with the way in which teachers are trained in many parts of the world. I simply don't know enough about Catalonia or Spain to say anything there, but certainly in uh, jurisdictions where I work, I'll take one Canada, they have become increasingly critical of how universities train teachers because they find it too disconnected with the real work of schools today and the innovation that's going on in schools. And the great schools, High Tech High, which I mentioned, selects people to come and work in its schools and it trains them themselves. So it doesn't, it doesn't outsource it to a university system. They have become accredited as a teacher training organisation and they are a graduate teacher training organisation as well. They run distance learning for teachers all across the world now. And they do that because they do not trust the universities really to, cut, to enable training teachers to acquire innovative methods and to be in tune with a very different way of learning and teaching. In other words, putting learning first and not teaching first. You know, there are some systems who say more learning, less teaching. But that, of course, is a very, very sophisticated form of teaching. It's not really less teaching, it's different teaching. On the selection quest question, um, I mean, in many areas of the world, teaching is a rock-bottom choice. 
um, one of the problems facing Australia is that it's the bottom decile of students coming out of universities who choose to go into teaching because it's seen as a very low status, very poorly paid uh, profession. That being the case, of course, you've got all kinds of problems. At the other end of the scale, Finland, the very top third of graduates go into teaching and they have to have a master's degree. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, um, except to say I think we need to rethink how the profession presents itself, what we think of as the profession, particularly as information technology becomes more available and more prevalent. To see people just as a physics specialist or a math specialist will no longer do. I think people have got to disidentify with their subject and think about being people who design learning. If we marketed the profession as a design profession, designing learning, we might get some different outcomes. You don't have energy, do you, for anything that you don't care about? I mean, that just sucks the energy out of you, really. And when I think of some, I mean, I could have approached this lecture very differently. I could have just kept my mouth shut and shown you four videos of kids alive with learning, alive with it, from some of the most difficult circumstances you can imagine. And this isn't a question of their socioeconomic status or the entertainment value of a rapping teacher. It's about finding ways to identify areas that kids care about and showing how the skills, whether they're calculation skills in maths or how you create a scientific experiment, feed into those issues about their society and their community, the relevance issue, I think. So the time and space is really important. If I give you an example, and if you don't know this, I again invite you to Google it and take a look, of the Big Picture Company. Has anybody heard of Big Picture in here? Yes, one or two? So Big Picture is a, an international organization. It's a not-for-profit. I visited a number of schools. I spent a week with one in Providence, Rhode Island, which reduced me to tears on many occasions. I've written the case study in, in our book, Learning a Living. Big Picture believe that... Firstly, kids' passions, what they care about, is the starting point for your education program, how you design learning. So kids don't go into classes. You talked about the factory model here. You said that that's what we have and we do. They turn the factory. They don't try and get a better assembly line in the factory. They blow up the factory. And so kids go into what they call advisories, which are groups of 12, and they stay in that group throughout their school career with a single advisor. I said to the kids, what if you don't get on with the other kids and you, you don't like them or you don't like your advisor? And they said, you have to learn, which I thought was an interesting response. Now, the point of that deep relationship making is that the advisor constructs a learning program, a learning journey for this student's passion. If this kid here cares profoundly about Formula One racing or about um, guinea pigs, let's say you're 11, you know, the strange things. You can construct learning journeys which will bring in all the core subjects into that in ways which may exhaust his interest in guinea pigs and take it onto something else, but you start with something he cares about. These kids in big picture schools spend two days of every week in internships. Not work experience, internships. Is that a Catalan word? Does that, yeah? So of the students I met, they might be working in a hospital or in a radio station. Some were working um, on a military base. Others were working in a charity. The school had 600 organizations, companies, not-for-profits, all sorts of community uh, uh, organizations which would offer internships to their students and they needed them because the kids spent two days out of every five there. The other three were spent in the classroom. You talk about reconfiguring time and space, they weren't bothered about time as the school usually has it, they just threw it up in there and said no we'll shift it. Three days on school campus, two days in a variety of other places and it's the job of the school advisor to bring that together in a coherent program. Their results, look them up, big picture school, Providence, Rhode Island, it's called the Met Providence, Rhode Island, are amazing. 
And you can't imagine kids coming from more difficult circumstances. Do they have energy for learning? I'll say so. They come just so keen to get out there and to show that they can be capable and contribute. A student, um, so I know I'm going on, I care so much about this. A student I met who came from um, a Hispanic family. Her parents had emigrated to the US from Colombia. They didn't speak any English at all. She came to the school not speaking any English. And she thought, she didn't know, she thought she wanted to be a photographer. So initially the school arranged some internships around photography. But as she grew and as she got interested in other things, she started to get interested in law. So she got an internship at a law company, um, the, the, the legal office of uh, the city hall for Providence, Rhode Island. And what they had her doing was translating leaflets on identity theft for young people. Identity theft is a big issue for young people, but they rarely understand it, and so they were providing some information leaflets, and she was translating them into Spanish. And she saw her own leaflets distributed at libraries all around the community that she had done. You know, not some theoretical project or something that only her teacher saw, something that really mattered in the world and that she was responsible for getting it right. She's now been uh, accepted into law school. She's determined to get to postgraduate school at Harvard. And she said to me, maybe I'll be the first Latin American president. <laughs> she found energy. What I have found, someone here said she was retired at 68. You're much too young to retire, much too young to retire. I think it's when you get to this decade that you start to feel a level of confidence about what you think. Hard won. <laughs> hard won through the years and my in my career you talked about my long trajectory it's true it's long I've spent years arguing with policymakers saying look at the evidence look at the research think but the system remains unchanged and so my theory of change my strategy now is to work with systems where you have a critical mass, sufficient numbers of schools who are going to demonstrate that this stuff really works well. And if you get more of those, if you turn it into a social movement, not just a research base, a social movement, which through TeachMeet and Twitter, more and more students and teachers get passionate about, then I think that we will see the demand side, not the supply side, taking this up. It's the demand side. We've got to have parents and students saying, that's the kind of learning we want, not that stuff. Because this is the stuff that will turn us into successful entrepreneurs or people who can become community leaders, not just show that I've got good grades. So I think that, and I might be wrong, but this is my best shot for the rest of my career anyway, Build great practice in great schools which are networked and together maybe we can start to form a social movement which will have enough parents and enough students saying, you know what, that's the stuff that will really make a difference. I think it's really, really important that such schools volunteer and wish to go this way. So nobody chose them, nobody said you're in it and you're not. Um, the programme is being sponsored and run by the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership. It's called AITSL, if you have a look at their website. And what they did was they issued an invitation to schools to express an interest. So uh, what was called an expression of interest, an EOI. So schools could write in and say, we buy into these principles. We care about these. We've been trying to do it in this, that and the other way. And we want to push on. And we want to push on with other schools. And on that basis, they're in the program. So entirely voluntary, because someone mentioned energy before, and I think energy <laughs> is so important. Um, if people haven't got the energy for this stuff, then you, know, you, you don't force anybody to do this. You can't choose them. They have to choose themselves and want to do it. So that's how it was done. When we do a program like this with participating jurisdictions, or if you take the New York iZone, the first thing to do is to do a global scan of great innovative practice. Don't think that you have to make all this stuff up from scratch as if nothing had been done. There's a huge amount out there 
and the technology tools now give us the means to connect with other educators in really, really meaningful ways. So we can look at a huge amount of video evidence from successful teachers who are involving families and their communities profoundly in young people's learning. So the competencies can be acquired, but I think it is extremely important for the teachers to be prepared to rethink their role, to get away from the idea that my job is to perform, whether it's rap or anything else, perform my knowledge of chemistry and pour it into your head, but rather my job is to design really powerful learning experiences that you care about, that will involve others, and that will bring my special subject knowledge to support your learning. So I think that idea that teachers need to be prepared to rethink their role, and by the way, some teachers are really excited by that. For a start, they're starting to work much more closely with other teachers. You can't do this as alone in a, a closed classroom. It almost always involves collaboration. And that's a great thing for teaching because it, it can be a very lonely profession otherwise. And what we call deprivatizing teaching and making it part of a collaborative approach is a powerful engine. I, do, I really do think that leadership is critical to this. I've known a couple of teachers, I, I could name them, I could name the schools, who started to get powerfully involved with teach meets and online communities of teachers and saying, whoa, I can see this will work so much better, and starting to do it in their own classroom or perhaps on a small scale with very little support from the principal or the head teacher. What happens is that they burn out. They just cannot sustain it without a sense of collaboration with your peers and without the leadership support. So I think that the leadership of schools is a very big target for us. We never work with schools unless the leadership is committed to this way of working because it's just asking too much of the staff. The leadership has got to be fundamentally committed to this. And um, in many schools, they absolutely are. Well, the schools, the, the systems that I've been talking here have a, a variety of, of ways of inspecting. In Australia, they don't really get inspected, per se, unless there's a problem. Um, as you know, in the UK, there's a very rigid inspection system, which is creating a very difficult climate of fear. But in Australia, there really isn't such, such a context, um, which is a good thing because it enables a degree of creativity and flowering. Their problem, they have two problems. One, politicians who are in power find it very difficult to say that their education system isn't working. They have to talk their education system up and pretend that it's terrific because they are accountable for it. They're taxing people to pay for it. And so electorally, it's very, very difficult to say that. And to put yourself forward as an innovator, as a politician, is extremely difficult. So I do feel, and I, I, I gave my conclusion on this a while ago, I know that many politicians know this and get it, but increasingly, I think, for myself, I've concluded that the best way forward is to get such a critical mass of great practice, which demonstrates, doesn't just argue for, but demonstrates that the outcomes for students are superior, that the young people themselves can articulate the value of this form of education, um, that the demand side will overpower the kind of rigidity of policy making. I might be wrong about that, but I don't know a better way. Avance there.